Einen wunderschönen guten Nachmittag hier im Rathaus. Vielen Dank auch an das Rathaus, das uns ähm, es ermöglicht, hier die Inauguration der Akademie des Verlernens unserer neuen Programm Denk, aber auch Praxisschiene bei den Festwochen hier zu starten. Ähm, es ist mir eine ganz besonders große Freude, ähm, eine der wirklich ganz großen Denkerinnen auf dieser Welt hier heute bei uns äh, begrüßen zu dürfen. Uh, a warm welcome to Professor uh, Gayatri Spivak. Thank you very much. Let me make myself comfortable. These days I can't stand and talk anymore. No clock, eh? All right. <coughs> Wait a second. Wait a second. What did I say? See, after all of that elegant introduction, I now have to arrange myself so that I can be... Ah, yeah. It's okay. Yes. I see that it's a triangular seat, a new thing. Okay. All right. Well, I'm very happy you're here. And I'm myself very happy to be here. It's a great honor to be asked to open this very well-known festival week. Indeed, I'm terrified. But let's see what happens. And let's see what time it is, yes. Now, I have two charges. I'm a paid teacher, and so therefore, a paid teacher of the humanities. It's a very frightening task because the humanities do not teach information. They teach how to change desires and the teacher has to assume the responsibility of learning that difficult task. I'm myself not a good teacher. It's a very scary thing to have this job. But I'm always very careful to do what I am asked to do. So I have two charges. One of them is to inaugurate the Academy of Unlearning. Incidentally, fair learning and unlearning are not the same. Fair has a different kind of nuance altogether in German from un, which is much more flat in uh, English. And I'm glad that that is so, because mere unlearning is, own, is very narcissistic, and it's possible only for the elite. But Fairlernen is something I will talk about a little bit. I um, wrote that one must unlearn one's privilege as a loss. In the 80s, before I had actually entered the second time into the field of work, which was 1984, when I started working with the wonderful activist Zafrullah Chaudhary in uh, Bangladesh, and then in 1986, when at the request of a middle-class rural activist, I opened the, 86 now, so that's a long time, uh, I opened the five schools in, the very, in a very, very poor part of West Bengal and started teaching seriously. Unlearn one's privilege as one's loss belongs to a period before that engagement. When I began working, I realized that in fact what I should do, because it is not possible to unlearn one's privilege, privilege is historically given. Therefore, rather than focus on myself, and unlearn and unlearn. I should use my privilege against the grain. Let me tell you a little, I'll tell you two little stories and then I'll move on. If I don't finish 
in the allotted time. I will tell you what I was going to say in the rest of it, and we'll just have Q&A. At any rate, the, what I say to my students and teachers and supervisors in the villages is this. I am your enemy because I was born a caste Hindu. I do not believe in anything, but nor did my parents. I'm good. My parents were fantastic, and I'll say this again in my talk, but two generations do not undo thousands of years of denying you the right to intellectual labor. So therefore, try to do without me. So you see, this is, and I now, the biggest challenge, I had the good fortune to sit with Ranajit Guha uh, this, uh, late this morning and into the afternoon, the leader of the Subaltern Studies Collective, and as I was saying this to him, uh, smiles were breaking out on his face and I felt enabled. Mm -hmm. So I was saying to him that this is the biggest challenge to unlearn in, in the sense of faire learning because what you have to do is to use that learning, I, I've called it affirmative sabotage, right? To use that learning against its grain rather than unlearn it and learn to learn how to work with mind machines that have been destroyed by your own ancestors. This is an unbelievable challenge. So this, and then at the other end, I also teach at, the, at Columbia University, which is a very uh, rich uh, private uh, university, and I teach on the doctoral level, and I don't teach South Asia, I teach European material. Vergleichen der Literaturwissenschaft. That's what I do, German, French, and English. So therefore, that's at the other end, right? So that there too, I have to unlearn what I was taught at school in the sense of fair learning, to use it against the grain in order to learn how to undo abilities in the children of the superpower who all want to help. So you see, this situation of being at the two ends has allowed me to say something to you about founding academies of fair learning. May I please lexicalize that word into English and call it fair learning? And so therefore, <laughs> the, um, another story, I've already told you the story of what I say to my students. The other story is, that of one of my best students weeping in my office last Wednesday before last. That is to say, I think that was April 26th. He is in, the, in his fourth year. He's going to graduate with his Columbia degree. He is a student in the philosophy department, but of course, analytic philosophy, where unfortunately, the subjectship of the philosopher is left absolutely unquestioned. So that there are people with the training of analytic philosophy who can dare to say that they can actually feel and grieve with all precarious beings in the world. Eh? What one is reminded of is that, remember, I'm a British literature person. Uh, one is reminded of the passage from Shakespeare where Glendower says, I can call the spirits from the vasty deep. And Henry says, why? So can I, and so can anyone. But when you do call, do they answer you? See, this is not a question for analytic philosophers. So this wonderful young man, whose name I will not mention, obviously, in my, he's all, all semester, I'm not a philosopher, I was trying to teach them how to read so that they could think about the words global and universal. And all semester he has been so well taught 
to summarize, to find the gist, to tell you what the, what the text really means, to cut through all the crap, get to the point. You know, will to power through knowledge, I control it. Idea of knowledge is knowledge about knowledge. That's where he's at. And he's a fantastic student, but he couldn't read. He was so muscle bound that he couldn't let it go. And you know, I ask my students to write a page of response for each class. I look at all of them as quickly as possible. By midnight, they send it the day before. And I construct my class on the basis of those responses. Not once was he able to read. He was able to summarize. He was able to show perspectives. He was able to relate and so on. But I asked him in the final thing to do Wollstonecraft and Tom Paine and Rawls. He couldn't do them because I thought I'd give him stuff that he could work with, but he couldn't read them either. He can't read. So the last day, he could see how much I wanted to really bring him in, and he started weeping. Nice white guy, very good student, best student in philosophy at Columbia University in the city of New York, sitting in my office and really crying. And I said to him, hey, cry, cry. I'm, it's good to cry. I'm not your mother or your shrink. I won't mind. It's good because what it shows is that you, some desire has shifted in you. You're re realizing how hard it is to unlearn. Eh? That's, wh that's why I, I'm, I'm using his example to begin with. And I'm sure I'll be in touch with him in graduate school. And I said to him, people are going to reward you for what you can do, but you will know that it's not allowing you to read. So this is something that I want to put at the head of whatever I have time to say. Let me also say that the other charge that I've been given, that is to say, talk about uh, the um, what time is it in, in the on the clock of the world. It's a, it's a statement not just by Grace Lee, it's not a statement by me. It's a statement by Grace Lee Boggs, but not just Grace Lee Boggs, um, um, African American, um, somewhat upper class, extremely well-educated um, activist thinker, but also her husband. I don't know why her name has been dropped, but his name has been dropped because it's politically incorrect to keep the name of a man, but the book is by James and Grace Lee Boggs. But in there, at a certain point, she says, they're talking about the Black Panther's 10-point uh, program, that it, there is something wrong about just asking for one's rights. And I'm with her there. I'm with her there. There will be other things. It's a hard thing to say. You know, this was the problem also with the chartists in Britain. If you're thinking about the history of unlearning, fair learning, and the time on the clock, this idea of, you know, calling uh, the, uh, calling the sans culottes citoyen, that's what we are talking about, right? That sentence, aux armes, citoyen. There's something unbelievably moving there. To be a, called a citizen when you weren't. Today, we know the migrant problems here. I mean, nothing has changed here as well as in the United States. To be called a citizen is something else. So in that situation, to be able to say that democracy is not just about your rights, it's not just me, 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 however poor you are, and however justified your demands. It takes courage to say that. And uh, James and Grace Lee Boggs do say that just a demand for our civil rights as the Black Panther's 10-point program give out, that is not enough. Anyway, so that's where I begin. The um, means, the, the entire project that I'm talking about then is a changing of desire. And I would also say, to repeat myself, uh, to say that fair learning for me is learning affirmatively to sabotage learning so that you can use it for those who did not have the right to intellectual labor, turn it around and use it against the grain in order to learn to learn 
how to teach those whom you have yourself damaged. And I say this to all European radicals. I say this to all European radicals. Do not think that your own history has not put you in a position where you have to ask this question. The Franz Fanon in very bitterly said that after independence, the nationalist bourgeoisie think that their best friends are the former colonizers, the radicals among them. And I think we should remember that lesson. You should remember that lesson before you decide to establish an academy of unlearning. So the, um, let me now say just a couple of things about my other task, the task to ask. I can't turn around. I hope uh, it says what time, uh, what time is it on the clock of the world. Mm. Now, this, uh, the, the real problem with this is that it is completely from a position of US exceptionalism. The question is asked on US Independence Day, 4th of July, 1973. And the point is made steadily that, the, uh, that Americans, especially black Americans, must find a way to revolution that is suitable for the United States alone. She even does say, let us forget Africa. And so she moves on like that in order to suggest that other countries in the world, underdeveloped, as she calls them, must learn that this is now the place which has been most developed and therefore revolution can come forth from here. I'm sorry to say that I do not agree with that position at all. I don't think, in fact, the, it is the United States that's, that was going in 1973 to show the rest of the world, including the underdeveloped world, how to find, how to, how to, how to look toward a revolution that would be on the model of the United States alone. This is something that is a problem for me. Also, there is a complete misunderstanding of pan-Africanism there. For Ms. Boggs, whom I respect a great deal, she is, after all, a graduate of Barnard College. <laughs> I teach at Columbia, and Barnard is a college that belongs to Columbia. So across the street from me, therefore, whatever she was ill-taught was ill-taught by us. So she's a graduate of Barnard College and doctorate of an extremely elite small school in the United States, the um, uh, Bryn Mawr. But at any rate, so uh, Ms. Box, she may have had an MA rather than, I don't know, I do, it doesn't matter to me. But at any rate, the, she understands by Pan-Africanism only Marcus Garvey, the Jamaican, um, uh, Jamaican colonial who came into the United States and who, according, I have more respect for old Marcus Garvey, the, um, uh, but who, according to them, only wanted to go to Africa and then attack the United States. She does not know anything about the Pan-Africanism in which Patrice Lumumba, Franz Fanon, Kofi Aounard, W.E.B. Du Bois, Nkrumah, all of these people, Jomo Kenyatta, all of these people were deeply involved and as she is trying to prove that the colonials, the colonized, were not as important as the black uh, US folks, the African Americans, where I sort of agree with her, and I've, I have made this point, she does not realize that the great Pan-African movements, which, which uh, have failed, but nonetheless, it's something that we work with, the great Pan-African movements wanted, in fact, to bring all of the uh, folks who had been undone by colonialism together. So there's that problem also. And uh, finally, let me say that she was not able to say anything about not going outside of the United States because she's writing in 1973 
the stock exchanges are not yet being electronified, and so therefore, what is seriously globality has not begun. And today, in globality, we have to ask how to ask this question, what time is it on the clock of the world? And we do know that it cannot be in terms of either US exceptionalism or European exceptionalism. Even to turn your back on uh, the Enlightenment, and of course in the United States, the Enlightenment has been cast aside completely now. We are back into the divine right of kings, but at the same time, th those will not be the places from where we are going to be asked that question. And in fact, as a result of the enormity of the migrant crisis, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the crossing of the Mediterranean is not quite like the Middle Passage, but nonetheless, the enormity of the migrant crisis in um, uh, Europe as well as in the United States. What is happening is that the continents of the world are becoming adjuncts to the radical diasporics in the Euro-US. I want to go there, but before I go there, I just want to say that I want to mark where I agree with Grace Lee Boggs, and then I will go on to talking in terms of the fact that we have to look at the continents of the world again. We cannot just look at the diasporics, uh, radical diasporics in the United States and in uh, Europe, with whom I certainly work. I certainly am an activist worker with them, but the continents of the world cannot become adjuncts to these folks. Now, Grace Lee Boggs, where do I agree with her? I agree with her when she realizes that what has to happen for a revolution to happen is that people must change. Those who are being, those who are seeking to bring the, uh, the revolution about must become different people. They will have to become different people. That there, that I do agree. She says that they cannot just want they must themselves re realize that there is a distinction between wanting and needing. They want, need. These are desire words. Huh? The third word is desire. And want to change, to learn to recognize between wanting and needing, that is what we call rearrangement of desires. That is the task of the humanities teachers, uncoercive rearrangement of desires. So that, uh, she writes, not only their political institutions, but they themselves must now be embarked on a, a road not accelerating and worsening their political irresponsibility. So she goes on to say that they have to change, and not only by going to books, but by becoming different kinds of human beings so that the life and death, as she says, of the entire human race depends on the revolutionist in the United States and such people must therefore become a different kind of person. So they have to be, and she says that they, not only must they themselves change, but it requires the intervention and the creation of other kinds of human beings. Human beings who define their identity and conceive their human dignity in terms of social responsibility rather than in terms of material and or ethnic interests. Now basically, I am in agreement with this. But on the other hand, I do not believe that one can say so easily that one can create new human beings. I have been trying now only for 30 years, not very long, but I teach, I teach as I teach at Columbia. I have not succeeded. Historical crime cannot be undone so easily. So therefore, you don't just, being an American revolutionist, you can't just go into the world and create subjects. Today we know that's called 
the idiocy of NGO intervention in so-called uh, so education. And also, another thing that she doesn't notice, which certainly someone like Gramsci notices, and W.E.B. Du Bois, whom she never mentions, also notices, is that this task is persistent because every generation is born as it is born. So therefore, the only thing that we know the human being can do is destroy. The Anthropocene begins with the Anthropos, not at a certain period. And so therefore, the task that our generation from these earlier folks has learned is that real education very seriously dehumanizes. It's a very difficult thing to say, but believe me, I know what I'm talking about. So to an extent, the, the persistent, the need for this kind of unlearning or fair learning, she is not into. She doesn't look at that. And also, the idea of human dignity. This is another phrase. I will come later to talk about uh, what the World Economic Forum, which is, you know, she's a, a party line communist, and uh, World Economic Forum is the exact opposite. But on the other hand, they, are, they share this strange conviction of the peculiar phrase, human dignity. That's an English phrase. And in fact, you, I can certainly, I'm a translator, I can find synonyms, but translation is not finding synonyms. Translation, as I know, because I have an excellent translator, I had a short conversation with her. I have apologized already for giving her this difficult text, but I know she'll do better than I would have. But a translator knows that when you translate, you try to find the cluster of ideas. And if it is necessary to do it in more than one word, you do it so that the people you are speaking to have some sense of what is being spoken of. Human dignity, you, you can find, you can find um, synonyms, but the, the reason why one knows that it's not worth translating is that it has not been creolized. Whereas words like harassment, for example, in the thing, in the Declaration of, Indip uh, Declaration of uh, the Human Rights, th I mean, the Declaration of Human Rights is constantly translated into very elite level other languages. But this is a romanticizing of languages other than uh, the Euro-US languages, as if they're born free. This is a ridiculous kind of reverse racism. But what happens is that the actual users of the human rights stuff can't even understand those words. Most of them are illiterate anyway. They creolize the damn words. Harassment is the, word, is the creolization of harassment. Techno eh? lozi is the creolization in Bangladesh of technology. So the, these are words that are not to be translated. So to that extent, the idea of human dignity is something that we should put on a shelf high up. Anyway, so now I want to uh, remind myself of what I just said. I've already taken 25 minutes. The, um, remind myself of what I just said and get into um, the body of uh, the talk. I said that in this hour of reckoning, extraordinary migrant crises in both Europe and the US and the government's turning more and more toward the right. This moment on the world clock, the continents of the world are in danger of becoming adjuncts of the concerned diasporics with the good whites. The concerned diasporics and the good whites together. So in that understanding and re realizing that today it is known that this pride in European and US exceptionalism is no longer viable. The world's clock is not set to them. In that understanding, we ask, who can ask, understand, and try to answer the question, what is the time on the clock of the world? What time is it on the clock 
of the world. Now, I want to show three short videos. They were made by someone in that area where my schools are, from where I came back on the 10th. So, therefore, they're not good videos. I understand they've been edited here, which is excellent, but they're not good. But the, I, I will tell you what they are. So, can I have the first one, please? And I will now explain what it is, and then we move on to the second one. Ask her in Bengali whether she can tell the time. And she will probably answer me in the negative. I don't know because I have not asked her. But you can see the story. See, she didn't even answer. Now, you know? this is Annapurna Mondal. My teacher, she is a high school graduate. Now, I am going to ask her in English, and I think she will be able to respond, but I'm not sure. Annapurna, what is the time? What is the time? What is the time? Four. Can you see? No. No, no. No. What is the time? Time is for love. Sakya Pan. In English? In English. There's so much noise. For the. For the. Very good. Thank you. That's it for now. And you Thank see, you. this woman, the one who couldn't even answer, she is an extremely capable woman. She has cows. She dies at 70 years old. Would you, would, can you say she's 70 years old? She's really tough. And you know, I uh, dye my hair sometimes, but I had cut it off because I was going to the villages and I see she has white hair inside. So, oh, Lotika, you dye your hair. I cut off the top and brought out the roots because I was coming to the villages. Next time, I'll keep my hair dyed. She's a very capable woman, but she couldn't even say anything to the question, can you tell the time? So now these people, I will talk more about them, but let's go to the second one. This is my friend, Asha Dattu, from the rural middle class married to an activist uh, in the uh, local NGO, a very old and famous NGO, from the uh, middle class in the suburbs of Calcutta. Now, she is probably going to be able to answer this. She's herself a high school graduate. She's probably going to be able to answer the question in English. I'm going to see. Asha, what is the time? The time is 6 p.m. Very good. Now, do you understand what is the time on the world clock? World clock. What is? What do you think is the world clock? I know. Okay, you can say it in Bengali if you like. What is the world clock? Sokalatte in America. But what is the world? What is the world? You can say it in Bengali. What is the world? Yeah, PTV. Absolutely. Absolutely correct. She says there is so the nothing world like a world clock. No world clock. This is a rupa. Eh? World clock. A metaphor. I use the word rupa, which is the this word for metaphor. I told her that. Big conference. What is the time on the world clock? That is why I'm asking my friends, what is the time? Thank you. Okay, that's all. So this one is, as I said, she's rural middle class, right? But both she and the smartest woman, illiterate in the next thing, said it doesn't make sense to say the world clock. And to an extent, of course, the time on the world clock is zero hour, as indeed your declaration does have, at a certain point, it does say that the festival tries to create uh, temporary ground zeros, and I'm with you there. Yeah, but I'll talk more about it if I give myself the time. Let's see the third one. Another village. And these are my friends. Saraswati Lohar, Purwani Lohar. Asha Lohar, 
is an old student of my school, and this is her mother, Rupali Lohar. I'm going to ask them a question about time and clocks. Okay? They've been to Calcutta, which is 300 miles. Can you tell the time? What's the time? I'm asking what time is it on the world clock to the smartest of the illiterate friends. Good morning. Again, she's saying there is no such thing. Kobita, that word is poetry. She's not educated enough to catch the word for metaphor, so I'm using the word poetry. So what did what they did tell me was that they had not gone, that they had not gone to Kakata, which is just about 300 miles from here, and that they did not know how to tell the time from the watching. On the other hand, the one who's sitting on my right, a very smart woman, she can. They're all illiterate, but she can. And on the other hand, also, they knew that there is no such thing as a world clock. So I explained to them that it was poetry. I did not use the word for metaphor here. And the young woman who goes to school, I think she's in class 10 or something, she clearly has not been well taught so that she could not answer me in English and did not know what the word world meant. So I just wanted to give you a sense of these women who are my friends, who are smart people, but who do not have the wherewithal to be able to ask this question or answer it. What I was trying to say was that this specific question is not askable by the people who, in fact, bring in the tyrants that rule the world today, who make our world. Why? Because these women vote. They are kept, you see, that's the work of the schools. They are, and that's the thing that uh, uh, James and Grace Lee Boggs said about just asking for rights. That it is so difficult. See, they dressed up because they were being uh, photographed because they never photographed. They are dirt poor. Now, the idea that, they, that there is, is anything substantial to parties and so on is not there. And I do say to them, it is important for the top to keep you below a certain level of education, not to agree that you have minds. Because if you develop democratic judgment, you would not elect them. So therefore, this unlearning is an unlearning or a fair learning of the absolutely, absolutely established idea in their heads that they are wretched because they are not as good as we are. If you go look at the chapter on the so genante Akkumulation in Capital One, 
the zogenante, because there is nothing, you will see that Marx tells exactly this story so that uh, James and Grace Lee Boggs' critique of Marx as someone who didn't really understand all of this is a little misplaced because the story there is exactly this, that there were people who were not good enough and we who are good enough must help the people who are not good enough. In other words, caste system. And what kind of help did we give? such that they became dependent on us and we became tremendously rich. So this idea of, and you know, this, and then he goes on, but this is right there, first paragraph or second or whatever, right at the beginning, first page. So this idea, it's still there. The largest sector of the electorate in Africa and Asia are kept under a class apartheid in education so that what they have to unlearn is that their wretchedness is normal. That the, you, know, you see the ones who uh, agree on the, on, on the videos and because they also are not so dumb that they do not have a millennial rule that when the benevolent and feudal upper class comes to visit, agree with them and smile. But in fact, the idea of really uh, becoming revolutionaries in the largest sector, I'm not talking about actual movements. I mean, God knows in Chhattisgarh, the middle class leaders are using them so that they're dropping dead and being called Maoists by left-wing adventurists. But at any rate, well, that's an old, old phrase, eh? It's an old phrase, running dogs of imperialism. But at any rate, the, so uh, th therefore, this idea that even as they hate you, they know that they deserve this. It's a, we, when we were, in fact, I was born before independence, we were convinced that we were second class cultures, even as we resented it. We were convinced. My first boyfriend said to me, darling, my foreign friends think you're very good looking. Think. That's, that was the thing, white friends. So, no, that, why? Because that's real judgment, you know. So therefore, she didn't say, say it to me in English, obviously. But at any rate, so for this group, there is no specific space with the name art or culture, even when the European words are avoided. Yet, all of them vote. We have to remember this. It has to do with the tyrants setting the world clock today. All of these, I mean, if you look at the Doyan, you look at the Nazis. I mean, one of the reasons why this uh, festival was founded in the 50s, to say that Austrians were not identical with their government, huh? it was brought in democratically. Uh, so, because the so-called structure of clean elections or counting numbers, democracy as body count ain't democracy. Fano writes about this again and again and again. And even Plato, even Plato, you know, who uh, in fact was writing about municipal governments, as you know. I mean, he was not writing a book called The Republic. There was a mistake made by a tra the translators. I mean, his book is called really city governments, huh? city constitutions, municipal governments in very uniform uh, areas where the structure was kept. Even he who didn't like democracy all that much, but even he said over and over again that the only way that it would work is if everyone is educated in judgment. Now this thing, and if you look at the third chapter of The Wretched of the Earth, which thanks to the misunderstanding of the impatient reading of a radical European philosopher, means for most people that he's only endorsing violence. Fanon, but in the very long middle section, again and again with uncanny clarity, he says that the only way in which post-colonial Africa is not going to become nothing but what Weber called um, um, patrimonial states with democratic structures so-called to keep one party government in place and run the government by patronage. Now this is true not only in the post-colonial nations, but nonetheless, Fano said again and again in that book written in the last 10 weeks of his life, knowing that he was uh, perhaps um, uh, programmed for a painful death, 
36-year-old man, he wrote again and again that the only solution is for the young to be politicized, and next, next sentence, by that I mean an education unconnected with immediate uh, goals. Uh, and Gramsci's question is, and Du Bois's question is, is it possible to give this education and not produce an oligarchic mindset? That's my question too. It's an extremely difficult thing. It is not just quickly unlearning, no. So this particular thing upon which, and yet for what, for what we have for education today is knowledge management. That's what we have for education today, or STEM. Again, tremendously far in substance, yet technologically connected to all the big items that we have so far been able to launch through the Vienna Festival Week. You wrote me, Töne und Gegentöne, Theater an der Wien, Big Beat, Big Motion, world unknown to Vienna of new post-dramatic theater forms, Arena 70, counter festival for new art and social forms, create frameworks for new alliances. These are connected technologically. I mean, you have had to constitute yourself as a corporation. These are connected technologically with the really destructive knowledge management technique with which education is given today, even as people at the top can unlearn. Remember, fair learning is not unlearn. So therefore, the, um, even though my schools will never use those techniques, I want to go to Africa to show you the failure to produce appropriate subjects to ask What's the time now on the clock of the world? And therefore, a hope for democracy in the world. We must remember, as I said, that even Plato, even Fano, etc. So now, what we are going to look at is what is the, quote, education as development as such. Let us look, not yet, not, not yet, okay, I'll tell you when. Two beautiful African women who have wanted to remain anonymous. They are two sisters. The first, now, I, let, me, let, you, let me tell you what the project is, okay? This project, since I don't have African languages, is to associate with what is called R and D, research and development. I work with two faculty members, Helen Yita and Aloysius Denkabe, at the University of Ghana, Legon, great colonial university like my own, where I got my BA. University of Calcutta. I am an adjunct faculty at Ghana Legon, and I, these are humanities teachers. And another uh, woman, Wanjiru Gichuhi, at the University of Nairobi, who's a social scientist. Now they, like that student of mine who was weeping, they are so disciplinarized into asking these terrible questions to the, their class inferiors, the very poor women in the rural urban interface, that nothing can come, development is a joke. So we work together trying to find a way to fair learning disciplinarization and use it in another way. Now this thing that I'm going to show you is a little bit from one of the last um, films made, uh, videos made by Helen Yita and Aloysius Denkabe, the two women are sisters. Let me tell you a little bit about them, and then. Now, they, uh, the, uh, the first one is, um, has, has chosen to speak in Twi. She can speak English, but she decided that she was not going to speak in English. Twi is not her own language, but she's the more active one, and when she goes to market and she exchanges, she talks Twi. So for her, Twi is the language of trade. And so it's an extremely interesting choice. So we cannot say that these women are not able to ask that question, except they can't because, and I'll tell you in a minute, the other sister is a little softer. She had been uh, sent to, uh, to Accra to be able to be educated in this horrible way. 
because I think by her third mother, because uh, they have, uh, they needed one person to be educated. And the third mother died, and the third mother's children stopped. So she's without any help. She's received very bad straight education, okay? They're extraordinary. They were squatting in a little house, which was a mansion, on one side being built, no, no toilet, obviously, no roof, for, except for a little bit. You will hear all kinds of noises, as you heard on mine. And they, one of them has decided to leave, the Twi speaking. And she is going to a place called Winneba. The voice of the questioners um, are the voice of the two uh, people that uh, uh, we work together. Okay, so perhaps now we can have first, uh, first charity, the Twi one, which has the transcript on the side, and then we can have one after the other, and the second one, Mary, who speaks in English, and she is, um, she says that her other sister is going to Winneba. Okay. Yes. Oh, go ahead. I understand she. Not as much as I would like to, but. Make me back in 2019. All the dates are in English. Maybe you could go on to the next one now. Do you don't have anything else to you that you think is uh, important in your stay here and like that to talk about? And so, yes, yes, about living in a place like this. Yeah. Also, because the uh, project is going on, yeah. the owner of the land, she has already had us to know. So, my sister is planning to move yeah. uh, so that we can move to Minima. But now it's because of my education. Yeah, yeah. So she has to go. Yeah. So she is in Winnipeg. Yeah, she will go to Winnipeg. Yeah. If not, all of us will be going. Mm -hmm. So now that's what I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. Thinking about it. But why whenever? Yes, because she chose to go far from here. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, getting known as mm. area like this or any other place is costly. Mm. But for me, but okay, just... let me tell you mm. about Winewa since I'm uh, coming to my end point. Winewa, which you know, like Mumbai and Kolkata and so on, it used to be called Windy Way, okay? So Winewa. Winewa is being developed by an American company in Maryland as a resort. And therefore, 
these droves of this, oh, the first woman is going there because there will be droves of underpaid, almost um, slavery level forced uh, work available. And since they're being kicked out of that place where they're sitting, which is a mansion being built by another African, so therefore, one of them is, and I don't know what the other one is going to do, the longer interview, she doesn't know where she'll go. So Winewa is the sister city of Charlottesville, Virginia. I have been, as usual, you know, as being a woman of color, et cetera, uh, I'm asked to do, give all kinds of big talks. I've just been asked to deliver the Thomas Jefferson Lecture at the University of Virginia, which is Thomas Jefferson's university in Charlottesville, Virginia. I can assure you they do not know that Winewa is their sister city. Now, I want you to look at a clip of Winewa. If I could just see the first clip. There we go. See, University of Education, what does that mean, first of all? University of Education, Winewa. You see, this part is actually the, um, this part is uh, developed by the American stuff. This is not where uh, charity is going to live. Now, I would like, to, like you to see what their curriculum is. Now, the curriculum is 42 pages long. Okay, can we see the curriculum? So obviously, I haven't given the whole 42 pages. This is just a taste. And, the, and uh, you see, they even have a diploma in theater arts, but look at the other ones. And then the, the actual um, thing is given there, the URL, if you are interested. So this, are, this is, in fact, a knowledge management preparation in entrepreneurship, insertion into the circuit of capital, which is without any kind of other preparation. So I want, if you want to jump from this to South Africa, you will see that in South Africa, it's the same sort of thing. I'm not going to read the whole thing from South Africa, but I was asked once again to speak in KwaZulu-Natal some years ago, two years ago, in fact, it's just, and I looked at something called the Quality Enhancement Project, which was being circulated in South Africa upon all of the university teachers. I read it very, very carefully, and they were very, very um, sincere in promoting this quality enhancement project. Every teacher had to teach in that way, and I quote, the focus is necessitated by the combination of low participation rate, only 17% of 20 to 24 year olds, low throughput rates, and stark racial bias in student success. No one can fault this. Although it's very far from, uh, um, from unlearning. Except that in order to achieve speed and convenience, the framers went to the work of a man called John Cotter, who teaches in the Harvard Business School, who developed a program within a business context and then expanded into other contexts with no real care for specificity. Imagine that South Africa, in its current condition, has to listen to this quality enhancement project on a business model while we can talk about unlearning. And the, in the published literature we read, much of it can be adapted to a higher education context. The way in which one leads and succeeds in business is good with these kinds of knowledge management toolkit type systems. That sort of success is not the success in preparing the ground with damaged cognitive systems. To insert the disenfranchised into entrepreneurship without subject formation, tra formative training, is a sure formula for corruption and violence. When I work with my, at home with my teachers and supervisors, I told you what I tell them, so I'm not going to repeat myself. So, but this thing, I'm obliged to say that in fact this kind of toolkit and template where teaching is made easy, it actually destroys the possibility of education in the broader sense. It is a formula for success where the specificity of groups is generalized as in the Cotter expansions and success is measured in soft statistics. 
And you know, in my neck of the woods, in the primary schools, whatever you get, the teachers don't teach. And whatever the student gets, even 2%, they're passed in order to enhance the lit literacy or high school, how many years of schooling in the Human Development Index so that India can rise in the Development Index. I'm not talking about something I've read in the newspapers. I know these people, these are my students. I know exactly who they are and how their lives are destroyed. So to an extent, we have to remember that this compromising of quality and development and existentially, existential impoverishment by complete confidence in so-called toolkits and templates is the way in which all of the, uh, the, the so-called uh, people who are below a certain class line, the largest sector of the electorate, supposedly are taught in that way. In fact, they're not taught. And the statistics that are produced are incomplete and incorrect and quite often there in order to rise on indexes. We have to remember this before we decide that we can, as I said, in the case of analytic philosophy, we can touch the whole world. Then Henry will ask, when you do call, do they answer you? And just the agreement, agreement of your diasporics group in uh, Europe is not the whole world. The world clock is not set there. So to that extent, the I will say, now I have spoken for a whole hour now. I think I'm not going to say anything anymore. I will just tell you what I was going to say, and you can ask me questions. I was going to quote from what I said to my own university just in January when they were uh, in Calcutta, when they were celebrating their 200th anniversary, okay, 1817. I'm not going to read it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a breakdown of what happens to the elite enclave at uh, big universities in the so-called global south, even as they're up for sale in a reverse racist description, as if the global south is monolithic for uh, resources and allocations, clusters of excellence in Europe. And then I would have said uh, what I wrote since I'm still on the experts committee of the World Economic Forum, what I had said on the blog to them. And I will keep a formula from there, which it, it was against knowledge management. Right at the end, I had said that you are what you are going to have to do is real knowledge depends on cooking the soul with slow learning, not the instant soup of a one-size-fits-all toolkit. The world is not populated by humanoid drones. You cannot produce a toolkit for, quote, a moral metric. Or if you do, you will be disappointed. Slow learning, or the, uh, the cooking the soul with slow learning, a formula. And then I would have read from what I said to the Shanghai Biennale, where I was not understood at all by all of the biggies, you know, documenta, this, that. I, they kept talking nonstop about Deleuze, whom the British pronounced Deleuze. But at any rate, the, there, was, uh, there was that. I mean, they were Foucault and Deleuze. But at any rate, so, I mean, they don't know how to pronounce these names, for heaven's sake. But at any rate, the, uh, uh, there I said that what they have to, dis they have to think of is the idea that uh, art also and universally provides access to a stop time in which nothing resembling history happens yet. An empty time suffered as empty, the very time of the human condition only stopped. It does not disturb. Historical unlearning does not disturb, disturb this. It's a stop time, para-contextual, short of history. So to an extent, the, um, that's something I would have said, those two formulas. And then I would have gone on and I'll read the very final paragraph that I do believe I did write. Yes, so the, um, I say in the final paragraph, the formula then, there are these two formulas. Hmm? No one seemed to understand the, uh, uh, the histor historicality formula 
in Shanghai, but then there is also the other slow cooking formula. For the moment, this other formula, the stop time, I know you will understand this because of your, uh, your uh, feeling about ground zero. Map making, blanking history, soul cooking, learning in unlearning, in learning endlessly, all in the interest of something that we are obliged to call democracy that demands that all Muslims be considered equal, not just the good ones, that all gendered bodies are considered equal, not just women. All races must be considered equal, not just your own or your own former colonies, and class must be learned to unlearn. How to do such a hard thing? Ah, then the strict divide between academies of learning and unlearning must be actively and ceaselessly undone. See, in Europe, in the last few months, I was asked in Berlin, in Utrecht, and now here, not to talk like an academic. I'm an academic. I value the possibility of what one can do if one undoes some of the incredible constraints within which the corporatized academies of the world are suffering and making others suffer, and you are within that problem. As I said, you are constituted as a corporation. So to an extent, in order to answer that question, a very difficult question, that to be equal is not to be the same. I can't do it, but I can tell you something about it. But for that, the, one has to undo the strict divide between academies of learning and unlearning actively and ceaseless, ceaselessly. And as a paid teacher, your servant, I will then welcome you into my classroom, just as Wittgenstein, whom after all you all know, said, you cannot learn how to play the piano with one lesson. We've seen all of those one lesson teach-ins and be-ins and this-ins and that-ins. I started teaching in the US in 1965 as a tenure-track uh, assistant professor. So all that, th that US idea of consciousness raising by just not doing homework w is a very fine idea of how to do instant soup in terms of your own interests and a belief that you can make change easily. So to an extent, the, if one really wants to learn the answer to that question, then welcome to my classroom. Thank you. Okay, now the floor is yours. It's hard, isn't it, <laughs> to ask the first question, because I often do, in order, not because I have anything to ask, but in order to make other, good, good, just ask me anything. Stand up, so that other people can. After the, Go ahead. after all the other questions to you in person, that's my question, yeah. Okay, so go ahead, you ask, and maybe someone else then will ask, and I'll take three, and we'll move. Ask. Mm, 
Well, um, who are you, first of all? What do I'm, you do? My name is Elizabeth. I'm a high school teacher. Uh, many of the um, uh, topics that you've been talking about interest me a lot because I find that the level of uh, teaching is, is falling enormously. Like, I, I'm not sure if my students know what a wet metaphor is anymore, <laughs> to be honest, yeah. Uh, so... Uh, but you do. Of course. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I do. But yeah, I? of course. Uh, so, um, that's, that's one thing that has been interesting for me. I think um, that uh, we have to globally ask ourselves the question how uh, we can... Uh, because um, the huma humanities that you mentioned, uh, they have uh, tried to teach um, people uh, in a non-functional way, but uh, in fact, uh, we are losing that connection even in Western, I mean, sorry, I, you, I mean, you, I've you certainly have a better term for years. that. But I, we, I think in current education, even though I try really hard, it's mm. quite difficult to keep that level because for some reason globalization has brought about a sense of, of thinking and teaching that, uh, that uh, it, I think the, the biggest problem is consumerism. That's, I think that's okay, one but, of the biggest you, know, you should threats. make a little speech because there are others who want to ask a question. Sorry. What's the question? No, I, th my question is that I would like to speak to you after what I'm writing on, after all the questions that have been asked. That's my request. But what are you writing on? Um, I'm writing uh, on a topic which is not connected to your... Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm doing a speech. No, I'm writing about theology and I'm writing about um, about the connection between the subaltern in religion yeah yes but I don't think I'm going to answer the, you this question after all of this eh? uh, it, it, it is your interest I quite understand okay but we will find we will have to find another moment yes okay so I'm glad you asked because you broke the ice okay but yes. uh, but and thank you for, for, the for saying this. Okay. The, it's, a, the, it's an extremely important question. If there is time, I will answer it. Okay. But I'm not going to definitely answer it, okay? okay? Subaltern and religion. First of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, really inspiring. I see. Do, do we do the Who Am I game again? Uh, are you what? Do, do we do the Who Am I game again, like we did before? I c couldn't understand what you No, sorry. Your uh, name, oh, yes. right. yeah. Do we do the Who Am I game today, uh, or again, like we did before? OK, no, just, um, OK. So I'm a, I'm a philosopher. Uh, from Vienna. I'm, I'm teaching here at the university. What um, uh, concerns me primarily um, within your talk and the practice of your talk is before you talked about uh, Vox and the uh, Black Panther program, you uh, inserted the distinction between want and need. It was I mean, boxes. That was boxes, right? Okay, yeah, and now is the interesting question. Is this a distinction you would uh, want to make uh, in this program within humanities of the relearning and learning of desire? Is the distinction between want and need necessary? Uh, and how would this look? Can you speak to this? Because this seems to me Excellent. crucial for praxis. Excellent yeah, yeah, question. Yeah. What were you saying before that I couldn't understand? No, it was, uh, she was, uh, you asked her who she is. Yes, this, I wanted to know also. And your name is what? Uh, well, my name is Eckhart Lindner. I'm okay. a philosopher here. Yeah. Yes, so, philosophy yeah. teacher at a university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Yes, that's a very, very important question. Yes. Uh, let's, let's get to it as soon as the third question is asked. Yeah. <laughs> These are both very fine questions. I hope all the questions um, are like this. In your vast experience, have you ever encountered education which is not dehumanizing? But I like the idea that education should dehumanize. Oh, That's okay. what I was trying to say, that, you know, you have to have a real kind of sentimental relationship to the idea of being human uh, if, I mean, in, in terms of everything that we now know. I'm not, uh, I, uh, I'm not particularly enthralled by uh, the subject of the uh, straight, white, 
uh, man of property as something that everyone should be like, which is where humanism started. So to an extent, let's, let's uh, no, dehumanizing, I think, it's, is a good project. In fact, I have written a, a, a paper, which you may uh, find because it's published, where I say that, you know, since to be human, I'm beginning with the third uh, uh, question, to be human is imposed upon us as a sudden thing. Just read Melanie Klein. You know, the, um, and in fact, if you read Kant, philosophy teacher, I don't know if you're teaching so-called continental or analytic or what, it's the synthetic a priori to an extent. The, the things that come that you cannot, uh, cannot um, argue uh, legally for the, exist for the existence of these things, but somehow you have to assume them in order to be human. So therefore, in great mythologies, this is quite often represented as rape, whereas we give to this big, beautiful words like transcendental and so on and so forth. So, but on the other hand, Leda and the Swan, Europa and the Bull, there I'm telling you stories that you know, but in other kinds of stories, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Renan's question uh, when uh, Joseph asks Marie, qui vous a mis dans cette fichue position Marie? And she says, c'était le pigeon, Joseph. So to an extent, that's the story, isn't it? The story of, of you know, sudden, the Buddha, et cetera, et cetera. They're all raped generally by animals, animals who are, of course, standing in for the divine. So to an extent, the idea that the general structure of rape is the one that is the, uh, the, the, the fact of being human is connected with then what comes, the, de the destructive impulse, the self-centered uh, impulse. I don't particularly believe in original sin. I don't think it's anything like that. But on the other hand, it is really true, even controlling through knowledge. Why do these things happen? Why, if you don't make people unlike human beings as they normally are, why do you see that cyber stuff is always stealing, pornography, uh, uh, horrifying hacking? You have to put all kinds, why is it? Why does the law have to be enforced constantly? Why is it? So that to an extent, the idea that uh, you have uh, to uh, make people you know, worthy of the name of the human being, etc. I just can't mooch about the human in that way without really being completely unrealistic about the history of the world till today. That's part of my uh, planetarity stuff too, number one. And the other one, the idea of uh, want and desire, is that necessary, want and need? You know, I don't know because Want, need, and desire, these are very simple kind of uh, pre-critical psychological model, okay? I mean, I know that they are used in things like behaviorist economics. Economics trying to give some kind of twist to rational choice brings in this kind of model. So I would say that since, uh, I, and it's also too moral, you know, I'm not one who would say, listen, be good. Eh? Be good is a useless uh, kind of directive. If you change and rearrange desires, you want to do things that are seemingly, you know, when you teach children to kill, they will kill. You know, it's like writing on wet cement, I teach children. So to an extent, it's not really a question of moral injunctions. Hey, take only what you need, not what you want. Then the fact that human beings are made so that they can make more than they need, that's where capital arises, art arises, love arises, um, the transcend intuitions of the transcendental arise. Without these, you can't mourn, you can't judge. You get confused there. Also, violence can be desired. Once you get into the question of gendering, it becomes a dangerous supplement, the incalculable. So I'm not one who would say, hey, you know, like Lear says, remember in Shakespeare, reason, not the need. So who the hell is gonna tell 
you. I mean, there are some, some people who really need uh, like things that I can't even think about. You know, when I'm in the, uh, in the villages as I was until the 10th, I don't have flushing toilets. I found out that I don't need them. I found out, I mean, it doesn't bother me. If I, uh, if I uh, put a bucket of water every time I do it, it's number two, and I'll, it, it, it doesn't smell uh, because it's nicely constructed, my little, uh, my little whatchamacallit. So, you know, it's not a need then, isn't it, is it? But on the other hand, you tell my sister brought up the same way that she's gonna have to live without and uh, with a little non-flashing toilet in a kind of, uh, you know, like a tiny little room. And she said, my goodness, no, I need a flashing toilet. So what is it? What do you want and what do you need? It's therefore, it's very hard to fix needs, as all consumerists know. So what I am interested in is trying to know the folks whom I teach well enough so that in a non-psychoanalytic, broad, thumbnail kind of way, I have a certain idea of what they desire, which is bigger than the need-want distinction, you know, which it's a little useless. Eh? So therefore, that, and then to be able to try to rearrange them, I can't change anything, but I can try to, re it, this is, this requires intellectual labor. This requires me to, on the other hand, to say, listen, just take what you need and not what you want to the very, very poor whose children are playing with stones and bricks. It ain't right. Well, they don't have what they need. Yet they must be taught that democracy is about completely other people. So it's, it's, a, it's, no, I don't think that you need the need want thing. And I don't think you need to talk about desire constantly. I do talk about it to, with my supervisors and teachers, but not with the children. I try to devise a pedagogy whereby they will want to want. See, want is coming in there, not using the word desire. They will want to want, not what they're wanting right now. It's a hard one. So it's an excellent question, but it's a practical question, see? You should see me at work. They went to uh, my Columbia class, but uh, I'm not a good teacher. But with these uh, folks, my heart depends so much on this challenge that the children know that this person who is never nice to them, really care, like everything depends on it, that their heads should open and they should want other things. Whether they can do that or not is something else, but they have complete confidence in me, this I do know. So therefore, it's a question that's constantly asked and answered in different ways. Subaltern and religion, I will in fact, I will answer the question because it does relate to this. See, I was talking to um, Ranajit Guha. I mean, I'm sure you folks know who he is, right? He was the person who, in 1983, I think, changed Gramsci's idea of the subaltern and started the South, East, uh, South Asian history group called Subaltern Studies. That's, uh, and there, he wrote a, uh, I met him in 84, he wrote a book called Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency, more than 30 years ago. What he shows there is that when, now the subaltern obviously is not generalizable. Subalterns are different in every part of the world. You can't generalize them. They are folks who do not have, uh, they, who vote but do not have access to the stru structures of citizenship. The, but in many different ways. I mean, if the welfare state is being dismantled, then the 99% in New York City are being subalternized. They do not resemble the, some of the subalterns that you saw in India and Africa. So subalternity is all kinds of things. And it's a position without identity. It's not like a primitive thing. 
And no one who can say I'm a subaltern is a subaltern. But at any rate, subalternity needs to be destroyed constantly but so that uh, the one enters the real circuit of citizenship. But at any rate, w w the subaltern generally is not educated into this idea of uh, social change in the ways in which, le let's say, Grace Lee uh, Boggs knows it, right? So therefore, their way of getting into the world historical, that is to say something bigger than just my problems and my group's problems and our sufferings, to think of a better world, not just for my, me and my group, is through religion quite often. They bring religion to crisis so that they bring subalternity to crisis. And so that to an extent, by and we, and this does not have to be the religion you were born into. The, one of the first, uh, first real, um, real struggles, insurgency against the British was, because 1857 was something else, I'm not gonna get, get into that now, just calling it the first war of independence does not make it the first war of independence, but at any rate, was by a man who was a, uh, an Aboriginal who, in fact, transformed millenarian Christianity into a, a political program of getting rid of the British. He was caught by Indian police working for the British. In the same way, what Du Bois writes about, W.E.B. Du Bois, in Black Reconstruction, after he has written, you know, the, uh, the, the, what happened after the emancipation of the slaves, after he had written about the black worker and the white worker, Du Bois writes a chapter called The Coming of the Lord, where, with great respect, he writes about the enslaved subaltern accessing the world historical through the transcendental narrative of Christ and redemption. So to an extent, this is why religion is both dangerous and powerful, because it isn't always, after all, mobilized for socially just ends. But on the other hand, the, I'd much rather have liberation theology without the theology. But on the other hand, it is really true that to an extent, the only thing that brings in a notion of the world at large to the subaltern would be these kinds of relig religious systems understood in this way, not in terms of institutional behavior. But the problem is that the institutional behavior where the imaginative scope of religion is turned into the most restrictive function of the brain, which is belief, ontological commitment. It really is like this. That comes hand in hand, so that it's both medicine and poison. And therefore, it's, uh, it's something which can't uh, dismiss as just Nebengeschäfte. But in fact, what we have to see is that these Nebengeschäfte, in fact, are constitutive of the better part of the religious as it gives access to the world historical. Now, it isn't only religion. It's also a great deal of exploitation that can break it. You know, the, those suicidal attempts, like my grandmother's sisters, or Boazizis in Tunis, etc. those are also, you know, something like getting to the world historical so that one's life begins not to matter. And in the case of Rosa Luxemburg, her idea was that so much exploitation went beyond a certain um, degree so that it became something different in kind. This is what she called spontaneity. That is to say, this experience so-called of the world historical, which doesn't come in terms of some sort of psychological spontaneity, but this access to the world historical through religion, a word that can be used, if you can use want, need, rational choice, why not spontaneity? These are all crude psychological words. So that's, that's where the subaltern usefulness for religion comes in. But I do think that one must not romanticize it, 
and one must not forget that it is in fact both medicine and poison and what must really be undertaken as one is fair learning is to make it possible not to keep within these great named religions, de-transcendentalize them through the imagination, take them away from uh, the, the only access to the breaking of subalternity as you break subalternity itself. Do not romanticize the subaltern. Do not rom romanticize their religious impulse. You may think you don't. It's easily said. It's easily said. Remember, every self-declared rupture is an unacknowledged repetition. It's a very useful formula for people like us who always want to claim too quickly. So uh, it was a good question, so I thought I'd give an answer. You can ask anything you like. These are really splendid questions. Yes. They will give you one. Um, my name is Damon. How? Oh, Donald? Damon. I can't understand. Move it a little. Damon. Ah, OK. Right. right. Uh, I hear you. Since you talked about, also, uh, you quoted authors. Um, I quoted who? Authors as Shakespeare. Authors, authors yes. So, uh, I asked myself, what can be the role of creative writing and speaking in contemporary times? Uh, doing, like participating in this unlearning because literature tends to do the opposite sometimes, in my opinion. Uh, so yeah, that would be my question. Solid question. Okay, anything else? So, dear Gayatri Spivaki, my name is Marisa Lobo. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again here. We met two years ago, opening a university in Linz. Again, you are here opening. Um, and for me, it's the question, uh, it's very hype, like the question of decolonizing university, decolonizing uh, knowledge in Europe. So as, as a kind of vocabulary, how do you see the question, because you said before, we cannot change these hegemonic spaces. How do you see the question of to deal with the contamination, because it's a term that's coming from you, the contamination of knowledge. Do you still see how, how, is the, 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 how to deal with the hype desire of the colonization of universities? Okay, anything else? That, again, an important question. Not that I can answer these questions, but I share these problems with you, so at least I can show you why I think these are important things. Anything else? Is there someone? My name is Sabina. I'm wondering whether I can elaborate some, something more about the affirmative sabotage that you mentioned before. Thank you. As for uh, creative writing, I would like to undo that adjective. I think, in fact, even so-called expository writing is creative. And in order to be able to read, one must be able to look at it that way. If you self-consciously are within a department of creative writing, it's, it makes me feel a little, I think there should be departments of creative writing because it's very difficult these days to make a living just writing. But that's a practical reason. You know, when you get into it, you share with your student that fact. Okay, so that they don't think they're really learning creative writing. See, the thing that the creative writing class that has been ignored by people completely is, again, within your tradition, not that the Greek tradition is yours, but nonetheless, Aristotle's poetics. Everything else that he wrote, and I said this in class, everything else that he wrote 
was written like a philosophy book, right? The Nicomachean Ethics, the uh, Politics, the Of Interpretation, you name it. But the Poetics is actually a creative writing class where he is teaching a bunch of guys in a moment when the epic is no longer liked by anyone, how to write so that they can win money prizes. And people have decided that these are Aristotle's theoretical descriptions of how tragedy should be. It's nonsense. That's not what he's doing. It's very clear. He even tells you why you shouldn't use certain kinds of words because they are in the epics. You know what I mean? A day and a night because the epics are too long. All of this stuff, right? So to an extent, the, I, you know, I started to teach at the University of Iowa. Wonderful, huge writing program. So, but no tenure, the, right, big writers teaching. So yes, we need creative writing departments. But just as I said before, you know, it, one must undo the distinction between creative and what, uh, what, destructive writing. That's where the problem comes. One has to be able to read everything as if uh, language happens on the page which is what my philosophy student couldn't do, and he was weeping. So what can it do? I don't know, because it's also so much part of, and not wrongly so, I mean, I don't mind if baseball players and big writers earn a living. I don't mind, but one can, one can dream of a revolution. So to an extent, the, it is so dependent upon all kinds of structures of patronage that in India, for example, the vernacular literatures, which are fine traditions, are going to hell, where, whereas Vikram Seth, whose novels I like very much, and Amitav Ghosh, whose novels I truly like, you know, it's not a question of liking or disliking. They get advances that these, the people who write in the uh, vernacular languages, regional languages, cannot even dream of. So what creative writing are we talking about? There is, it's a very competitive field in terms of what creative writing can do. Then the answer is also that literature is a very class fixed thing. Mostly you're obliged in a very sacred kind of way to read literature that most people don't like for the sake of being cultured. So that to an extent, again, you change the structure of desire so that you want to read material that sounds like nothing, you know what I mean? Rather than say, hey, this is good, you gotta read it, although you don't really like it, otherwise you're not cultured. That's one thing. Another thing is that below a certain class apartheid, literature means zero. When uh, Chinua Achebe, whose work I like very much, when he died, there was a celebration at Brown University, and there were lots of African uh, professors who had come, I was invited, and so on and so forth, and everybody was saying wonderful things. But I had to say, since I work in Nigeria, that's another thing that I didn't talk about, that also is related to unlearning, believe me. I had to say, I know that there are millions of people in Nigeria below a certain class line who have not even heard the name Chinua Achebe and for whom literature does nothing. The idea that if you read literature, Dickens, etc., to the subaltern, they will be naturally moved, Martha Nussbaum, you don't really read to uh, subalterns if you are uh, if you can make such a statement. No, literature means nothing. But the literary, which means so hanging out, mit weg sein, eh? so hanging out in someone else's space that you begin to become responsible for it, that is a very powerful instrument. And that has existed in one form or another in almost all social formations for dehumanizing this go. 
That's, so that's something. But within our humanities, you think humanities are taught in the way that I'm talking about it? I've taught for too long not to know. I'm not popular. I'm not popular. Because if you teach like me, you won't get into those digital humanities thingies, and you won't do uh, distant teaching with millions of people, et cetera, et cetera. No. So therefore, no, I'm not, I don't think uh, the liter the, uh, literature can do any, or creative writing can do anything by itself. It has to be worked at, uh, even as one ha keeps the departments, but shares with one's students, as I do with mine, that yes, you've got to get your degree, but the degree is worth nothing, except it's vocational. May or may not get your job. And you will, in fact, get a better job if you don't do what we're doing in class. You know, as long as they are your partners, then I think something. So that's the second one, right? Isn't that the second question? Is there a second or the first? Yeah, first, very good. So what was the second? Who asked me the second question? You asked me the second question there? Was it, uh, what question was it? Tell me again, remind me. I didn't write it down. So what's the question of how to deal with the, the hype, desire, the colonization of universities and art fields and, and the contamination of the, the knowledge contamination. as you, yeah. Okay. Well, that question also is uh, something that is very focused. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to get away from, uh, from uh, conceptual art? Or are you going to get away from the, uh, you see, the phenomenon in art today is the, I mean, what I know, I don't know, I mean, I go to the Biennales, okay. So over against, and then I'm asked to do the, do the inaugural talks, I teach at the Whitney Independent Study Program. So in these, in fact, for the first time in my life, second time, I'm actually going to co-curate a thing at the Whitney, Independent, Whitney Biennale this year on June the 17th. But at any rate, the idea that you have to be within a situation where you say, look, the Biennales are horrible things. Look at my uh, area, my country, some really radical art in my country that's really producing a very strong critique of that kind of globality, and you, I can connect them up with European critics, and inevitably, for some reason, Walter Benjamin, I can uh, inevitably connect them with European critics who are also wonderful. So this is going on in kind of nationalist projects like Grace Lee Boggs, so that you have this menagerie of my Iranian student right, doing this with Iran, my Indian student doing this with India, my student from Japan doing it with Japan, my Turkish uh, friends doing it with Turkey. So what does this mean? So we are in the middle of a situation. I want to be surprised by some kind of I mean, I'm not myself someone who produces anything that is recognized as art. So on the other hand, the idea of art means nothing under a certain, a certain level. So therefore, since I'm actually, uh, I mean, you know, people will say, oh, look how wonderfully, non-figuratively they decorate their houses. But on the other hand, the, uh, when you uh, discuss this as, quote, art, unquote. I mean, I'm not interested in patronizing these people who live within a reality that is absolutely other. They have one vote in India, so do I have one vote. So in that, we are equal the democratic body count, arithmetical equality. I don't want to patronize them with, look how wonderfully you are doing this non-figurative decoration. It's really something, isn't it? I don't want to do that kind of nonsense. Let them lose it and then find it again as museum stuff, right? So th that's what we did, didn't we? So therefore, I don't know what 
the answer is about undoing contamination. Now, what was the third question? In this section, I answered it already. Dehumanized, eh? Oh, how could I have forgotten that one? Okay, I should write it down, but I don't have a pencil. You see, I took out the thing that I thought had a pencil, it doesn't have a pencil. Anyway, affirmative sabotage. You have all kinds of things that you learned because you are able to come into this room. It already shows me that you have learned many different kinds of things, including, uh, not, including forgetting how to squat on your haunches for hours and hours and hours and hours, like some of my friends here can do. I mean, the ones you saw. Your body has lost certain kinds of skills, but you have learned a lot of things. Now, the idea that you are going to just simply not do them anymore because they are produced by dead white males is a very elite idea. I should also say that the master's house can be unmade only and best and in the briefest time by the master's tools. And how do I know this? Because I took the trouble to see that the person who said that that was not so, whom I respect greatly, said this in a moment of rage, rhetorically, like a piece of creative writing. See what I mean? Audre Lorde because she was treated like shit at NYU. She was very angered, and she wrote this sentence, the master's tools cannot be brought down by, uh, but the master's house cannot be brought down. She didn't write that as a piece of expository prose. She also told the story that people should use in order to avoid homework. Just as I said the, uh, this, I uttered the sentence, the subaltern cannot speak, in absolute rage because I saw that in two generations, the message sent to the family by my grandmother's sister who hanged herself had been forgotten by women, by women in the family. So I said the subaltern cannot speak, even when she had tried so hard. Those are rhetorical sentences. What you have to really understand is the force of the emotion behind them. They are not telling you, don't read uh, dead white males. Because after all, they had the time to develop these tools, know the tools, and then use them to work against what it was that they were working at. Like the entire idea of world governance in cosmopoliteia, in Kantsese, learn how to read and see that in it he says that this cannot, this can only be discussed in an empirical and not a philosophical way. That there is a footnote that says that I'm not writing as a philosopher now and we will have no examples, etc. So what to do after that? How do we undo this? Notice, for example, learn to read that the only section in the, I don't know why Kant has come to mind, the only section in the Critique of Pure Reason, which is all metaphorical, is in fact the one on the noumenon and the phenomenon. Truth is a lake and this and that. Why? Because if you read it, not like my student who was weeping, by cutting away all of that and just making summaries, then you will see that you can perhaps make it go somewhere else. So therefore, it seems to me that rather than just simply decide that anything that smart people who had the leisure and the position to develop must not be touched by us, know it well and turn it around, and know something else, that if it was a good idea, then other people thought it too, and they were not necessarily white males. It is, uh, it is, a, it is a, a disaster that they did not have the structure which would make that 
accessible. So to an extent, be on the lookout and be able to recognize that through this affirmative sabotage, you come to other people whom nobody would even recognize as theory because you, they don't wear the clothes that seem to be uh, uh, seem to be the proper costume for theory. So it seems to me that theorizing is a practice, and if you actually get into that way of enjoying the right to intellectual labor, you can indeed use other people's work, people who were not particularly politically correct in their lives, but had the opportunity. I mean, Mary Wollstonecraft and Kant were from the same time. Mary Wollstonecraft died in childbirth. Kant couldn't have. He could, he could continue. Eh? So to an extent, we respect what, what, where Wollstonecraft was going. Tom Paine also wanted women's education, but it wasn't the same thing. But he had more time. Fano died early, so aren't we going to look at the, uh, the, the similarity between Lumumba and, to an extent, Stalin? That is to say, Lumumba came from a Bush background and Stalin came from a serf background. That they, and then when Stalin was young, he was full of the kind of, the kind of excitement that Lumumba had when he was young, except he was destroyed by his own kind. So are we going to look at how he was trying to sabotage but was stopped by history so that it was, it's both medicine and poison and we do it differently? Or are we just going to make him into a hero because he was destroyed by the Katangans and Dagha Marshall? And are we going to not understand what Stalin was up to but just say, no, no, he was just a monster like Hitler. You see, these are programs that come out when you try to sabotage affirmatively what has been given to you as dead white males with their projects and their theories. I can't say very much more than this because I would have to show you in a classroom rather than just talk at you. So that's, that's what I would say. Yes, it's knowing well what you're looking at and then finding a way of turning it around so that you can actually use it for some other, in a, for, for a reason that was not theirs. So, I've answered, everybody seems now to be leaving. You want to eat, isn't that so? Yes, and in fact, I know that the dinner in, um, reservation was made for seven o'clock. So it's, isn't it five past seven? So unless you are totally dying to ask me a final question, that you think only I can answer, I, would, I will leave you with a reminder that it is very good to establish an academy of unlearning, but don't claim to have done so. Learn to be small rather than big this and big that and turning it all around and so on. Learn to be small undo the difference between the real academy, which is in great trouble, and uh, the academies that one founds, because as an elite, they can, they think, unlearn. Unlearning is almost impossible because the learning that's in your blood is historical. The claim that you make, the self-declared claim, is generally an unacknowledged repetition of something. So I would say it's and fair learning is better than unlearning. That's the affirmative sabotage I'm talking about. Let the, let the um, academy be what the first academy was, which is to say, walking about. Remember, there was a walkabout. They walked as they learned. I think it would be a great idea to move around and not have wonderful rooms and corporate existence, and you must do that in order to survive. I'm not against it. After all, I pay income tax in the United States. How many cents for the defense budget? But at the same time, the academy of unlearning should be dissolved as soon as established in reality. 
and no claims should be made. And when you want to ask that question, remember, the continents are not all accessible to the NGO radar. You cannot do these kinds of things with an interpreter. It's a collective work. There are many, many, the world's wealth of languages. You can't learn them all. Learn a few and you'll see how hard it is to want to access everyone in order to ask that question. And remember that it was first asked through US exceptionalism. Don't be exceptionalists. The first right that I have is the right to refuse. So thank you very much for asking. Bye-bye.